Ephesians chapter 6, we're going to look at the first nine verses. We're going to look at what it means to be obedient from the heart. That's the title of the message today, and uh, it's, it's really uh, just a beautiful exposition here that Paul writes in Ephesians 6. But before we get into that, I want to lay some groundwork. I want to recap. Let's go back to Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, where Paul writes, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. You're loved, is what he's saying. He says in verse 2, and walk in love. Be loved and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you. He's personal there, singular, and gave himself up for us, plural, and offering a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. So we're looking at imitating God. We've been looking at imitating God. What does that mean? How does that work? By walking in love. The, the primary mark of somebody who is imitating God is they're walking in love. Well, how do I walk in love, Pastor? You're telling me this stuff, but that sounds kind of nebulous. It sounds kind of generalized. Well, he gives us the answer. There's a beautiful progression here. That's why I'm going through chapter 5 again, just going to hit the high points, because this in chapter 6, it's part of a progression that Paul is laying out as he builds a case for these people in Ephesus that he's writing to, and we benefit by understanding the context. So how do I walk in love? By walking in the fullness of the Spirit. He talks about that in verse 18. I don't have the capacity to walk in my love is <laughs> very conditional, but his love is different. His love is an eternal love that he sheds abroad in our hearts. So how do I walk in love? I walk in the fullness of the Spirit. So what does that look like? We've looked at that. It looks like speaking, singing, thanking, and submitting. Remember, we, we, we talked about that. How does that show up in my life? The fruit of his Spirit. First of all, we looked at it, it shows up as mutual submission, that we're submitted one to another in the fear of Christ. And as we're submitted to one another, this beautiful thing takes place in our lives as we're connected to the head. And, and within that framework, within that context, he says, wives to your husbands. Remember, we looked at, it doesn't say wives submit to your husbands, it says wives to your husbands, absolutely implied but it can only be taken in the light of mutual submission to Christ. So we look at mutual submission, we look at wifely submission, and then we look at husbandly love. That's where we left off last time. And in all of that, we are in process. We are growing. We are becoming obedient from the heart. Seriously, we're going to use a jackhammer now? The dog stopped barking. <laughs> anyway, we're becoming obedient from the heart as we walk in love, as we allow the Holy Spirit in our lives personally to captivate our hearts. Out of that captivated heart, we're motivated to a whole new dynamic for life. And out of that new motivation, we are activated to love sacrificially. All of these, all of these attributes to walking in love are seen in the horizontal. We've talked about the vertical, our relationship with God, and the horizontal, our relationships with one another. And, and the vertical governs the horizontal. And we've seen over and over again, he doesn't say, wives, submit to your husbands because it's a good idea. He says, as to the Lord. He doesn't say, husbands, love your wives because you're the boss. No, he says, as Christ loves the church. He connects the vertical to the horizontal. And then this morning, we're going to look at children, obey your parents. Why? Well, primarily, he says, because it's the right thing to do. It's the order of things. We've looked at that. But all of these things that we're looking at are seen in the way that we relate to one another as we develop relationships with one another. We express these things. We express the fullness of the Spirit. We express imitating God in love 
as we build relationships with one another. When we're not in that place, the Bible calls that being in the flesh. I mean, when you're not in the spirit, when you're not walking in the spirit, the only other option is the flesh. And that's where I want mine. I want my way. I want what I want. I don't really care about you. I'm not going to give love you sacrificially because my love doesn't go there. This is great. <laughs> Pay no attention to that man back there. In Philippians, Paul wrote another letter to a church. It was in Philippi, another province or another city uh, in Asia there. And, and he wrote when he, he wrote something similar, and I think it's worth mentioning at this point, in Philippians chapter 2, Paul is talking about the mindset that we have as we walk in love, as we walk filled with the Spirit. He says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God didn't consider it robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation. He emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. You see, Jesus as our great example for obedient from the heart. Dropping down to verse 12 here in Philippians 2, he says, therefore, my beloved, this is where he applies it, we're not, we're, not, we're not becoming obedient to the point of death. No, that was Jesus' deal. But in applying it, he says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Now, Paul is not saying here, work so as to earn your salvation. That is totally contrary to the gospel of grace. But I want to ask you a question. What is your definition of freedom? In the world, the popular answer is, well, freedom is being able to do anything I want. And I would submit to you that's not true. True freedom is always from within the framework of a secure relationship. In other words, when I was growing up, I was free. I used to go out and hunt snakes and do all kinds of goofy things as a kid. But I was free within the framework of the relationship I had with my parents. I was free, but I, you, know, you can't go into a theater, a crowded theater, and yell fire. You're going to get arrested. You're not free to do that, even though you're free. So my point is, is that I don't get to do anything I want, although I am free. Whether in person or not, I want to obey from the heart because God is working in me. I am free to obey him. I've been freed from the power of sin in my life. I've been freed from the penalty of sin in my life. I will be freed from the presence of sin when we are there, when we are with him in glory. But in the meantime, we obey from the heart. We choose to obey him because we honor him in our lives as we do. What he's saying here is literally your obedience will show as the outworking of your salvation. When he says that whole deal there in Philippians, what he's saying is that the same thing that James does. He says, show me your faith and I'll show you my works. It, follow, it follows. It's the natural progression of things that Yes, you're free, and yes, you guys ever have, you ever train a puppy? <laughs> you ever train a dog? That dog is not obeying, you have the food. You know, that's what it, I mean, yeah, he is, but there's something in it for him. It's like, you see if they do, the, you know, jump through the hoop, and then the guy pops a treat in the dog's mouth and all of that. When I, as a young Christian, I really, I pushed back on this obedience subject. It was like, nah, that sounds terrible. <laughs> And I'm not a dog, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to pop a treat in my mouth, you know, kind of thing. And, and yet, as, as I've grown over the years, I've, be, I've come to understand that my obedience is a beautiful thing. Why? 
Because it's not under compulsion. It's from my heart. It's a response to the grace of God that's been thrown out and just put upon my life in measure that I can't exhaust. When he talks about fear and trembling here, there are two things that produce it. We don't need to walk around being afraid of God, uh, generally. Now, there are a couple of things where we need to fear God. The first is if a person is deceived and they don't know God, that person awaits damnation. That's when God's wrath comes to bear. We looked at that when we looked at what Ephesians calls the sons of disobedience. The second, and this is for Christians, and I believe that's Paul's intent when he's writing to the church at Philippi. He's not saying that you need to fear God's wrath. But there is that person who is disobedient, and he awaits God's discipline. He awaits God's chastisement. And that, the motivation is not wrath. It's love. We're told in Hebrews 12 that the Lord chastises those whom he loves. And so for Christians, if I choose to live disobediently, I need to have a healthy fear of dad, essentially. That's what what it means. I mean, that's what Hebrews says. There's not a third option, folks. You are either living... And, 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 and Hebrews tells us that the Lord chastises those whom he loves. He says, if you're without chastisement, you probably don't belong to him. So it's a good thing. And it's always in love. It's always to restore the limb that's out of joint. That's the picture, the word picture he uses there. So as we understand what this obedience that we're called to, yeah, we're looking at it with wives, we're looking at it with husbands. We've been talking about obedience for a couple of months. Remember, we've been talking about the fact that these things are commands. They're imperatives. They're not indicatives. An indicative is something that happens to me. Okay? An imperative is, some, is something that's required of me. And these are imperatives when he's talking about wives submit, when he's talking about husbands love, when he's talking about children obey, when he's talking about in chapter 4, put off the old man, put on the new man. It's an imperative. It's a command. And what are commands for? If you love the Lord, and if you're a, a, a well-adjusted Christian, they're to obey. They're to lovingly obey. Not because God put this mandate out here. We're going to talk about that. But because he loves me. And because my response to his love is I want to live a life out in the open that's pleasing in his sight and that counts for his kingdom. Now we're going to get into the text. <laughs> All of that was for an introduction. But it's really important that we understand the, the backbone of this passage. We have to understand these things in context. Because if not, we can just get out there and, and put these things down as empty commands, expectations from God that have nothing to do with his heart in the whole matter. Ephesians 6.1, he says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, For this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. So he says, children, obey your parents in the Lord. This is right. Paul directly, now what's remarkable to me is he directly addresses children here. You got to understand Roman culture. We're going to look at Roman culture again. We're going to look at Jewish culture. He's addressing both cultures. Ephesus is a Roman city. It's in the empire. It's nowhere near Jerusalem or Israel. But there were a lot of Jews that lived there. There were a lot of Jews that had converted from Judaism to Christianity. So he addresses both. He starts with Rome. In Roman culture, I've talked about it a little bit, there was a a, a law that was called the Patria Potestas. All right? What Patria Potestas was is it gives absolute authority over the father, the husband, the owners of the slaves. Absolute authority. He could sell his family off into slavery. He could force them to work in his fields, even if it was in chains. He could punish them at his own discretion. So if he's a creepy guy, guess what? You've got problems. He could even inflict the death penalty on his own family, on his own slaves. 
Further, the power of the Roman father extended over a child's life as long as he lived in his father's house. The word for children here in Greek is technon, and it's any child of any age living under his father's roof or her father's roof. Patria potestas meant a Roman son never came of age as long as he was there. He's under his father. Uh, It doesn't matter if you're a grown man. It doesn't matter if you have prominence in the society, all of that. You are still remaining under your father's absolute power because of this law. And into this, the apostle Paul shoots right past the dad. And he goes, and he starts talking to the kids. I think that's remarkable. In the same way that he said, wives, submit to your husbands, it's fitting. He goes right past the the husband, the father. And then he says, husbands, love your wives, not because you want to, because they weren't required to. Remember, we looked at that because of this cultural thing. Wives, women were looked at as property prior to Jesus elevating women to equal status as men. Essentially, what Paul is saying here, he's not saying, obey your parents, children, it's the law, but obey your parents in the Lord. Huge difference. This is not a mandatory thing. This is something that's a voluntary response to the grace of God, again, in a child's heart, understanding that grace is modeled to them through their parents or not. But godly parents are a true blessing to their kids. This is not forced obedience. It's voluntary. Remember, Jesus, remember he, they, they said, what's the greatest commandment in the law? He said, love God and love others. So your obedience, kids, husbands, wives, masters, slaves, we'll get to that, as out of love for God and love for one another. The motivation has completely changed. And this was a radical thing in their culture. He is shooting past everything that the dad, you know, his whole thing, you know, cock-a-doodle-doo and all of that. He's the guy. He's the end of it. Remember, Roman culture was set up to where the law and order was maintained that way. Through the, the, they broke it down to the simplest denominator, and that was the father, the head of the house, And he maintained law. And Paul's saying, no, 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 it doesn't have to be that way. Now you have a loving Lord that loves you. Now love each other and do this from the heart. Do it as a response to the grace of God. The point in this is that you'll never be as obedient as God desires you to be until you are relationally convinced of his love for you. Again, obedience here, it's not pop a treat in the dog's mouth. It's I have a loving Father in heaven that loves me to distraction. He loves me with a love that I will never fully understand. And therefore, I want to live a life that is pleasing to him. I want to do his will. I want, I get to obey him is what's being intoned here. You've got to understand his love. Otherwise, your obedience is really not going to count for a lot. Reminded of that as we look in Luke chapter 15 at the prodigal, the prodigal son. Remember, here's the guy. He knew that his dad had wealth and all of that. And he said, give me the portion that belongs to me, dad. Let me take what is due me, essentially, law, And so the father divides his goods and he gives them to the son and his son essentially loads up the four by four and heads out of town. He didn't have that, but but he went to, it says he went to a far country. Why did he go to a far country? He wasn't going to do what he wanted to do with dad right there in town. So he took himself away from any accountability, goes to a far country and he squanders the whole thing on, on fast living. And uh, don't need to go through all of that. But things go poorly for him. Remember, he ends up eating pig food and, and you know, he's slopping the pigs. And, and for a Jewish boy, that's really not a good thing, to, not a good vocation. 
Anyway, they go poorly for him, and he gets to a point where he's at the end of the rope. He's at the bottom, all right? People talk about people, they, well, they haven't hit bottom yet. Bottom is where you put it. <laughs> it's not some mysterious place that you all of a sudden arrive at, but it's when you kind of have this aha moment, like, you know, my life is really bad. And that's what he does in this story in Luke 15. All of that, uh, to pick it up in verse 17, it says, but when he came to himself... That's his aha moment. He said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger? I'll arise and go to my father and I'll say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven. So he starts reciting this whole speech that he's going to tell his dad when he gets home. He only gets like the first sentence out before his dad interrupts him and does some stuff. But he starts rehearsing, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And in that culture, that would be like we call a temp today. Not a slave, not an indentured slave. We'll talk about that. But uh, it's harvest, and we need more manpower, so let me hire some servants to come in. He's saying, let me be a temporary part of your household. <laughs> and it says, and he arose, and he came to his father, in verse 20 of Luke 15, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. The son, because of the circumstances that, of course, this is a parable that God allowed into his heart and into his life, decided it was much better to be obedient from the heart, to go back and to do it dad's way. What's really interesting in that whole account is the older brother. He refuses to go. You know, the, he gets back, his father falls on him, kisses him. He says, kill the fatted calf, bring the robe, bring the ring, bring the sandals. You know, my son was dead. He's alive. You know, we're going to have a party. And his older brother goes, huh, not me. You never killed the fatted calf for me. You never let me have a party with my buddies. And I've been here the whole time obeying you, is what is implied there. But the older brother obeyed his father from a sense of obligation. It wasn't from his heart. Verse 2, honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. Now he goes into Jewish culture. Now he starts talking about Torah, the Old Testament. Specifically, what we call the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. Interesting, he says it's the first commandment with promise. And you might, if you know the Ten Commandments, you're going, no, it's not. It's the fifth commandment. Why is he saying the first one? Well, you've got to understand, it, it actually, is, it's better rendered with a promise. Because the first four, you'll have no other gods, you'll not make idols, you won't take the name of the Lord in vain, you'll remember the Sabbath, keep it holy, and then those first four are Godward. They are vertical commandments. They have to do with your relationship with God. The next six have to do with our horizontal, with our relationships with one another. That's what we're talking about, horizontal relationships. The very first one of those horizontal relationships is honor your father and your mother. But it doesn't stop there because it's the only commandment that comes with a promise. He says that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving to you. There in Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. He goes on and he talks about don't murder, adultery, stealing, false witness, coveting, all that, the, the rest of the commandments. But the question here is how do you show honor to your father and your mother? Why is the horizontal tied to the vertical? Because it's an earthly reflection. Wives, submit to God. Remember when we talked about that? When, a, when God puts responsibility on the man in the household, we're talking Jewish household, Roman household, God, it, 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 whether, regardless, if you're a Christian man, God has put additional responsibility onto you, onto the man. He's telling the women, the wives, submit to that additional responsibility I have given your husband. In doing so, you are being obedient to me. It's not about your husband. I know how much I blow it as a husband. And yet, 
my wife's desires to be submitted to my headship in our home. It's not about me. It's about her honoring God. This is an earthly reflection of what's going on in our relationship with the Lord. So wives submit to God. Husbands, love your wives not because it's an option. It's not optional. She's not your property anymore. Scandalized in this culture, in both Roman and Jewish culture. Husbands, love your wives. It's not an option. You love that woman is what's implied. And God willing, if he is a Christian, and this is written to Christians, remember, I want to be real clear on that. If he's a Christian man, he's going to take this to heart, and he's going to want to elevate his wife. He's going to want to love her that sacrificial way that we looked at in five, chapter 5, verse 1. He's going to want to honor God through serving his wife. And now he says, children, obey. Why? It's to prepare you for life. It's God's order for things. It doesn't, it doesn't take rocket science to know that the family is under absolute assault. I look at the, the creed behind the Black Lives Matter movement, been to their website, and that organization sets itself against everything that we hold dear, every biblical concept, every biblical doctrine that we hold dear as far as the family goes. They are for the destruction of the family, along with a bunch of other stuff that I won't go into. I, I, I'm not going to make this a political message, but I, I am saying that very often fancy names on an organization like Right to Life, uh, or that Right to Life is, I, I, what I mean is, is pro-choice. I mean, Right to Life is Right to Life. But pro-choice, it doesn't mean that. So you got to get underneath, and I'm shocked at how many people don't really check the facts and see what it is that they're, what's being represented. Point is, the family, this thing that God has ordained, husband, wife, children is under assault. The academic world is part of the assault. You get some professor up in the front of a classroom, and, and yeah, I, I intend this for you guys, you students. Don't believe everything that comes from the professor. Yeah, I, this is a Christian college and all that, but that doesn't mean that you're not going to get stuff that the world is peddling to replace sound doctrine. That's free. That's not in my notes. What he's talking about is in verse 3, he says that it may be well with you. You know what? This is what changed my mind about obedience. It's not because God is there and he's got this list. Come on. Jump through the hoops. Got a treat. That's not it. He wants my best. He says, do this. Kids, do this. Children, do this. Because it, that it may be well with you. I want your best. I want to bless your life. I also think, he says, and you may, that you may live long on the earth. And I, I scratched my head about that. And then I started doing some checking. Remember we talked about the prodigal and the father's response to him being out there in rebellion and doing all kinds of goofy things, showering him with grace and love. And remember, the covenant that we're under is grace. It's not law. But this is what the law says about the same guy. Deuteronomy chapter 21, verses 18 through 21. This is if a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother and who when they have chastened him, will not heed them. Then his father and his mother shall take hold of him and bring him out to the elders of his city, to the gate of his city. And they shall say to the elders of his city, this son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He's a glutton and a drunkard. That's what the prodigal was. Verse 21 says, Then all the men of the city shall stone him to death with stones. 
I'm not advocating this. So that you shall put away the evil from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. The motivation for obedience under the law was fear. Do it and live. The motivation for obedience under grace is grace. It's love. It's done. Therefore, love. The way that Jesus treats this man was totally contrary to what was prescribed in the Old Testament. And he did it on purpose to, de to, to demonstrate God's heart. But think about it. You know, you're walking by the gate of the city. You see this pile of rocks been there for about a few weeks. It's, <laughs> it started out really stinky. And you're thinking, that's what happened to Ishmael's kid. I, you know. Yeah, you would, you would see it. You would hear and fear. But that was the motivation. No, that's not the motivation for us. I think about that, and I think, you know, little kids, children, uh, they do things that are cute. I was looking at Rochelle's daughter um, this morning. What is she, two or one and a half, whatever. In the middle of worship, she's walking up the aisle. She's going to come up on the... <laughs> and mom's running after her, grabbing her and holding her back and stuff. That's cute, right? I mean, it's fun. I, I love watching families and all of that. I love hanging around with my grandkids and, and all. It reminded me of my son when, when he was a year old. It was his first birthday. And he was a weird kid. Uh, and, sorry, Justin, if you're watching this. <laughs> you were a weird kid. But he, no, he was, it's like I used to bribe him and say, all right, you're going to get some vegetables if you eat your cake. And you think, no, that's kind of the opposite. No, he didn't like sweets at all. He liked other stuff. <laughs> I think to this day, he's really not all that wild about sweets. Um, but he, like, he would just devour broccoli. Well, at his first birthday party, have you ever seen those dog dishes that have like the two circles have one for the water, one for the food. Well, I got a picture of him on his first birthday. He's got this thing tipped up on end. Couldn't get him to eat the cake. But he's over there. He sits down on the floor and he grabs the cat's dish and he's eating cat food. That was cute. He's 42 years old now. That would not be cute. <laughs> that would be... We need to talk. <laughs> you need some counseling or something. The point is, a high chair doesn't work for an adult. Those things are cute in the context of growing up, in the context of being kids. When he says, you know, do this, obey your parents, because it's the right thing to do, that it may be well with you. There is, God's word puts forth these pictures for us. And we understand it's because we want our children to grow up well. We want it to be well with them. We don't want them to be constantly suffering. And, and, and folks, understand, you've got to give place for character. There are times where a strong-willed kid, I mean, the whole point that he's making here, what we do as parents is we want to break their will without breaking their spirit. We'll talk about that in a second. But we want our children to do well. And so this whole thing about compelling our children to obey and our children obeying their parents is so that things go well. It's training. He says, and fathers, don't provoke your children to wrath in verse 4, but bring them up in the training or the nurture and admonition of the Lord. When I grew up, I had a, I, my father was a, a lovely man and, and my natural father, my birth father, but I had a stepfather that was not a good guy. I mentioned him in passing before. But he provoked us to wrath. It was never his intention to train. It was his intention to dominate and oppress and sometimes actually torture. He was not a good guy. I, I don't want to get into in depth there, but uh, he was in a very abusive man. And I look at that, and, and when I first came to the Lord, when I first became a Christian, I had trouble understanding of the Father heart of God because I, like, I don't want that kind of a thing. But then I began to realize that 
my job as a parent was not the example that was set for me, but it was to train up my children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord and not provoke them to wrath, not cause them to rebel. How do you do that? You're so heavy-handed that you don't give room for your children to develop. You can be overbearing with a child. You've got to remember, it is your job as a parent to, again, to break their will, but don't break their spirit. Don't provoke them to wrath. Don't get them in a place where they're just walking around afraid of you all the time. If that's the case, you're out of balance. You need to repent and put things in the order that God has established here. It's training. It's not blind obedience. It's not forced obedience. It's voluntary because of love. They know that you love them and they want to obey you in the same way that you know that God loves you and you want to obey him. This is loving preparation of children for life in Christ and life in the world. And it's a blessing when it's carried out God's way. The gospel introduced a fresh element into parental responsibility by insisting that the feelings and well-being of the child must be taken into account. That wasn't considered before. It was dad's rule and that's it. In Roman society, where the father's authority was absolute, patria potestas, this represented a revolutionary, a radical departure, a revolutionary concept. And Roman dads needed to take it to heart, and moms, and kids. In our culture, this kind of harsh parenting invites rebellion. Oh, I, I can't stress that enough. I, uh, my daughter got engaged to a guy that was not a good guy. And, and I had to walk a very careful line because I didn't want to cause her to rebel, run off and, and elope with the guy. But, uh, and God worked it out where she ended up not marrying him. But that's a, that's a hard line to walk sometimes as parents. To not incite rebellion, to, 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 to chastise, to discipline, to love our kids and for kids to understand that it's their place to obey. They may not understand it. It used to drive me nuts. When my daughter would say, my daughter was, she was the, 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 the more disobedient of the two. And she would say, why? And I'd say, you're asking me why because you want to decide whether or not my reasoning is okay. I'm not going to tell you why, just do it. <laughs> and so there's that. But when you're disciplining a child, you really have to have control of yourself. That's number one. How can you expect your child to obey if you're out there binging along? What right do you have to say to your child that you need discipline if you obviously need it yourself? It's about training. You've got to always keep that in mind. That's why you don't discipline from anger. That's why you take these things to the Lord. You, I have literally had to wait till I calm down before going to my kids. The point in all of it is you're training your kids. Dad, mom, grandma, grandpa, look for teachable moments. I love finding teachable moments. I've built good relationships. Stacy and I built good relationships with our kids, and they know that we take our, our, chil our grandchildren's spiritual development seriously, and so they welcome our input, because we have, you have a special relationship as a grandparent that you don't have with mom and dad. This is just, this is just a difference there. And, and I would say that we look constantly for teachable moments for those precious kids. And they love to obey. They love because we've built a relationship. That's what this is about. It's relational. It's not the church's job to train up your child in the way that he should go. And when he's older, he won't depart from it. It's part of why the statistics for kids going through youth group and then going out there and getting into all kinds of stuff and just essentially walking away from the Lord, why they're so high. Uh, if you guys have known me long, you know that I feel very strongly when little Johnny comes of age, he's not going to, when he goes out to start his life, he's not going to model his life after his youth pastor. And not that I think that that's a bad thing. Youth groups are good, and I can't wait till we get ours back in place because I keep looking out at the kids, and, and it's like, you know, we want to be 
pouring into them and doing all that. And I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. What I'm saying is that when little Johnny gets out there, he's not going to model his life after that. He's going to model his life after his dad. And so dads, are you living it? Are you doing it? Are you modeling Christ to the kids? Look for teachable moments. Verse 5. I'm going to have to step on it here. Bondservants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in sincerity of heart as to Christ. Not with eye service as man pleasers, but as bondservants of Christ doing the will of God. Here's that term. From the heart. With goodwill doing service as to the Lord and not to men knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is slave or free. So in verse 5, when he says, bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling, sincerity of heart as to Christ. He's again, he's connecting the vertical to the horizontal. He's saying, you're not doing this to please your boss. You're doing it for the Lord. You're doing it because he is ultimately your boss. You could take this masters and servant thing and easily relate it to employers and employees. Notice he's not saying if you have a good boss. This is not about your boss. Any more than it's about the husband when her wife is submitting to him. It's about the Lord. And that's what he's saying. He's, he's saying, look, There's an order to things here. Now, I want to talk about doulos for a minute, and the the best way to do that is to just go to God's Word and consult His Word about what this term bondservant means. The the Greek word is doulos, or doulos, and and what it means is a slave, an indentured slave. Uh, Let's go to Deuteronomy, because the pattern for a doulos is explained there in Deuteronomy 15. Verses 12 to 17, he says, If your brother, a Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman, is sold to you and serves you six years, then in the seventh year you shall let him go free from you. And when you send him away free from you, you shall not let him go away empty-handed. You shall supply him liberally from your flock, give him meat. From your threshing floor, give him grain. And from your wine press, give him drink. From what the Lord your God has blessed you with, you shall give to him. This is a great picture of a servant's heart, even back in the backwaters of the Old Testament. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you. Therefore, I command you this thing today. And if it happens, this is good. If it happens that he says to you, I will not go away from you because he loves you and your house. Since he prospers with you, then you shall take an all, an all, it's like a, it's like a punch, and, and take him up to the doorpost and drive an all through his ear to the door. And he shall be your servant forever. Also do likewise the female servant and all that. So when he says, as to Christ here, that changes our entire perspective as workers, as bondservants of Christ. I came out of the world, I, you know, I was doing my own thing. I was, you know, captain of my own destiny and all those other silly romantic things. And I, and I came to Christ and I realized, you know what? The end of it isn't me. I'm not the star of my own movie. I'm not the center of the universe. There's someone far greater than me. And in that, I learned that, you know what? I was, I'm not my own anymore. I was bought with a price. What does that mean? That means now I'm a slave. I don't have rights. But I have a loving master. I have a Lord in my life that loves me, that gave himself for me, that wants my best because it's good. As his child, as his bond slave, now, I get to serve him. Folks, take this to heart. This isn't just good sounding religious stuff. This is, this is practical living. You get to be a servant of the king. And he's a good master. We're reminded that our work should be done as if we were working for Jesus himself when he's talking in context here of masters and slaves. 
Because we ultimately are. We do our work as unto the Lord. Not for man, but for his glory. Verse 6, he says, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. When he says eye service here, this is the guy that's only when the boss is looking. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I was an employer for a number of years, and uh, yeah, I had my little things where I, I would walk around the corner, and the guy that he's over there goofing off or whatever, or he hangs up the phone real quick, and it's like, and I, th- then he's busy. Hey, John, you know, kind of thing. And that's what he's talking about. He's saying, from the heart, it's the same thing that we saw in Philippians 2 when Paul said, be obedient, not in my presence only. (laughs) I think the apostle Paul knows human nature. (laughs) He's saying, don't do it just to look busy. Really, be sincere about this is what he's saying. It's from your heart. Your obedience is from the heart. Be bondservants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. The attitude of our hearts needs to be, I love my master. I love his house. I choose to serve him. That's what a doulos of Christ does. That's what a bondservant of Christ does. That's us. That's you. That's me. It's obedience from the heart. It reminded me of a ditty I learned, I think it was back in Bible college or whatever. It was a long time ago. Uh, and, and it's this. You don't serve God by pleasing men. He's talking about man-pleasers here. Don't do it to be a man-pleaser, he says. But you certainly please God by serving men. Once again, you don't serve God by pleasing man. You please God by serving man. And that's what Paul is talking about here. Verse 7, with goodwill, doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is slave or free. In other words, you will be rewarded. Now, there are heavenly rewards involved here. And what I think is remarkable is he gives me the equipping, he gives me the insight through the power of his Holy Spirit to carry this stuff off kind of like those 24 elders I was talking about in the book of Revelation. They fall off their thrones. They're prominent in Israel, prominent in the church. They fall off their thrones and they cast the crowns that they've received, the crown of righteousness, they cast it right back at the feet of Jesus because they know it was only his work that gave them the ability to do anything anyway. But he says, I want to give you rewards. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 to 15 says this, According to the grace of God, which was given to me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He's the one. Verse 12, Now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold or silver or precious stones, or wood, or hay, or straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work. Fire is symbolic of judgment. What it's saying here is your works, you're either laying up rewards according to gold and silver and precious gems, or you're doing things perhaps with bad motives, perhaps disobedient, whatever it is, the things that you've done in the body, that fire will test those things. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he'll suffer loss. In other words, the things you did were, were wood, hay, and straw. Then you, you'll suffer loss, but you yourself will be saved. In other words, he, you, some of us will have thinner files when we get there, I'm convinced. But the point is, is that he purges our works. And there are rewards involved. J. Vernon McGee uh, used to, I heard him say one time, he was talking on this passage, and he said, and friend, you know, if you know his voice, I I can't duplicate it. He always sounded like a cartoon character to me. But he'd say, and friend, some of us are going to get there, we're going to come skidding in, smelling a smoke. (laughs) And I think that's great, because we've all done things that don't count but I want to live a life of of willful obedience to my king. 
And, and he says, I'm actually going to reward you for that. Verse 9, he says, and you, masters, do the same things to them. Give up threatening them. In other words, don't do it with force. Knowing that your own master is also in heaven and there is no partiality with him. This reminds me, what he's saying here is, and I love telling people at this church, I was saying, you know what? I'm going to be the pastor here, but I've got a boss. And I do. And I take that seriously. I mean, he's my boss. What he's saying is, hey, boss, master, you've got a boss. Don't forget it. And he's not partial. He doesn't see you as being the boss. He sees you and that guy that works for you just the same. It's not partial. There's no pecking order with him. It reminds me of the Roman centurion in Matthew chapter 8 where Jesus, this guy, wants him to, to do a healing and, and, and he tells the centurion, says, look, I'm a man of authority. I, I say to this guy, go, and he goes, and this guy, you know, I, I understand authority, but I also know that I am a man under authority. And Jesus said, I haven't seen anybody in Israel with faith like that. He knows his place. Employers. This is something that, as a Christian employer, really weighed on me at times. Know my place. That's why I stubbornly refused. We, I ended up with a dozen people in my office every morning. We started with prayer. and We didn't go to work until we were finished. And I, there was a point where I said, God, this is getting pretty expensive. There's 12 people in here on the payroll. Because when I hired somebody, I would say, look, we're going to pray. We're going to, we start work at 7. We're on the clock at 7. And if you want to go wash your car, you want to call your wife, you want to go whatever, we're on the clock as soon as we're done praying. Or we're, we're working. It says, but you're on the clock at 7 o'clock. So don't let anybody ever put a head trip on you about you need to come in and pray because I had guys that didn't know the Lord. And most of them came to the Lord through that. But the point was is that, you know what? This is voluntary. This isn't mandatory. You don't have to do that. In order to work here, you have to come and pray with us. No, that's not it. But God honored that. <laughs> and, and it started out when I was there by myself, praying in my office. And then I hired a guy, and we prayed together. And then I hired another guy, and we prayed together. And then I started hiring people outside of my church. <laughs> and, and it got a little dicier. But the point was is that God honored it. And there we were with a dozen people. And I, I figured out one time, it's like, this is costing me like $1,500 a week to pray. And God said, you pray. Don't, don't even go there. And I, I obeyed. I mean, that was it. But the point is, is that masters, slaves, employers, employees, do your work as unto the Lord. And if you are over other people, let that be as unto the Lord as well. Obedience. Just to remember as we sum up, I'm running a little bit late and I'm going to show you a video. Jesus is always, always, always the focus of our obedience. We're not obeying a creed. We're not obeying a list of rules. The world looks in and they go, oh, you're just a bunch of people. We've got a bunch of rules. No, we don't. We're free. But we're free within a relationship. Therefore, we don't any longer do the things that we please. Is what God's Word tells us. He says, wives, submit to the responsibility that God's placed on your husband. Husbands, love your wives in the way that reflects Jesus' love for his people. Children, obey your parents. Why? Because it's right. That's what he says. Very simple. Slaves, employees, be obedient. You're working for the Lord. And finally, when he touches on masters here, bosses, it's about equality. There's no partiality with God. Perhaps you have been looking at this and you're realizing, I don't even have a relationship with God. I don't have any point of reference. Or perhaps you realize that you've been slipping. You've got to realize, folks, whether you've never come to Christ or whether you realize that perhaps you've been going through the motions. And no matter how many steps away from him you take, it's always only one step back. And it's a simple prayer. Perhaps you've been up in your, your parents' face. Perhaps things haven't been going well. Perhaps you realize an aspect of parenting that you need to correct. Let the Holy Spirit do what he wants to do in your heart. Do business with him. If you've never come to the Lord, it's a simple prayer. 
of God, I, I realize, I don't, I don't hardly know nothing about nothing, but I realize that you're not in my life, and I want you in my life. It's turning from the old life. The Bible calls that repentance. Saying, you know, I'm tired. I don't have answers. I'm stressed. I don't understand what's going on around me. I don't have money for the bill. Whatever it is. Jesus has come to me. Come as you are. Simply praying, God, I, I, I can't do this on my own any longer. I need you. And I don't just want you. And, and, and yeah, I, I realize that without you, my life is futile. And judgment does await the person that doesn't come. But if that's you, pray a simple prayer. God, forgive me for my sins. I turn from the old life. I embrace Jesus. I let the weight of my life down on Jesus this minute. And don't let the God of this world, don't let the enemy rip you off and have you think that was just an emotional thing you did. He's real. He's living and active in our lives. Let his Holy Spirit come in and yeah, he'll, he'll upset the, the, <laughs> the things in your life, the way you've done things, but he doesn't come in and just start pushing us around demanding obedience. But as he moves and works, we say, wow, Lord, your way is way better than mine. I want to love you. I want to obey you. Pray that prayer.